This presentation on basic hydraulic principles is the first in a series of eight, which provides a comprehensive introduction to hydraulics, the science of fluid under controlled pressure. Hi, I'm Paul Cook for Sperry Vickers. Hydraulics, like many branches of engineering, is both ancient and modern. You've all seen a water wheel, for example, which precedes written history. Obviously, though, the use of fluids as a means of transmitting power has had its greatest development in the past 50 years. Hydraulics is the transmission of power through the use of confined fluids. It's based upon a principle discovered by a Frenchman, Blaise Pascal, during the 17th century. Pascal's law states that pressure applied on a confined fluid is transmitted undiminished in all directions and acts with equal force on all equal areas. Here, let me show you. The classic demonstration of this principle is to fill a small neck jug with fluid and then burst it by applying pressure on the cork. <laughs> but rather than make a mess here, a more practical example is to show two pistons, one large and one small, interconnected by a pipe or tube and filled with fluid. A large weight on the bigger piston can be balanced by a smaller weight on the little one. To understand this better, Let's assume an area of 10 square inches on the large piston and only one square inch on the other. Now, since every action has an equal but opposite reaction, let's place a weight of 100 pounds on the large piston. This, of course, will require a force of 100 pounds to support it. This force spread over the 10 square inch bottom of the piston will amount to 10 pounds on each square inch or a pressure of 10 PSI on the fluid. According to Pascal, that pressure will be exerting a 10 pound upward force on the one square inch area of the small piston, which can be balanced by a 10 pound weight on its top. Now, before you start thinking that we've gained something for nothing, let's push the small piston down a distance of 10 inches. This will displace 10 cubic inches of fluid, which in turn will force the large piston upward. The large piston, because of its 10 square inch area, will only raise one inch. Like its mechanical counterpart, the lever, what we gained in force was lost in distance. So you see, you can never get something for nothing, not even in a hydraulic system. But we can perform efficient work. Basically, there are two motions we can achieve hydraulically. We can move something in a straight line, or we can make something rotate. A cylinder, or linear actuator, provides the straight line motion. It can be single acting, like a hydraulic jack, where the weight of the car brings it back down, or double acting, where the piston is forced both forward and backward in its bore by fluid under pressure. A rod connected to one side of the piston extends from one end of the cylinder to the part to be moved. Now, here's another point to remember. The force exerted by a cylinder depends on its area and the pressure that's applied. Force equals pressure times area. Since the rod reduces the effective area of the piston, the force available when retracting the piston will be less than it is on the forward stroke. The rod, however, will partially fill the cylinder, so less fluid and proportionately less time will be required for retracting than for extending. Here again, what's gained in force is lost in speed or distance. Now, the second basic motion we can achieve hydraulically, rotary motion, usually calls for a hydraulic motor. Motors come in a wide variety of sizes and shapes from tiny ones, which may provide only a few pound inches of torque, to huge models, which develop literally thousands of pound feet and can flip over a boxcar with ease. The most common motors, and pumps for that matter, are vane, piston, and gear type. 
but since the functions of all three motors are the same, we'll just use the ANSI symbol to represent them. A motor is driven by the fluid. With pump flow connected to this port, the motor would rotate in this direction, provided, of course, that we have something to drive the pump. Our drive could be a diesel or gasoline engine, an electric motor, or even a windmill. But for now, let's settle for an electric motor. Now, you might be asking yourself, why bother with a hydraulic motor if you still need an electric motor? But bear with me. As good as they are, electric motors do have certain limitations. Most run at a constant speed, let's say 1,200 RPM. Then, too, they usually turn in only one direction. And finally, we all know what happens if you stall one. If you're lucky, you only blow a fuse. If you're unlucky, the motor burns out. Now, with an electric motor driving our pump, let's see what happens with our hydraulic motor. Since it's a positive displacement unit, if it were to stall, it could not accept any more oil. The pump, also positive displacement, would stall too, since its outlet would be blocked. This, in turn, would stall our electric motor. Uh oh you say, wait a minute. Let's put a relief valve in this line. A relief valve doesn't have to be anything more than a ball held on a seat by a spring. You just tighten up on the spring until it's harder to push the ball off its seat than it is to drive the motor with its normal load. Overloading the motor would cause the ball to lift off its seat and divert the pump flow back to the tank, permitting the pump and electric motor to run even though the hydraulic motor stalled. Okay then, what if we direct the pump flow into this port, the opposite one? It'll rotate the motor the opposite way, right? Right. But instead of repiping our circuit to change direction, let's just add another valve. This one, a directional valve. We'll run a line from this port to one side of the motor, and from here to the other side. Now with the pump connected into here, we can flip this handle and direct flow into either side of the motor. Of course, there will be flow out of the opposite side, which we'll pipe back to the reservoir through this, the fourth port in our directional valve. Now that we've got a handle on a basic hydraulic circuit, let's try a little arithmetic. Let's assume the displacement of the pump is the same as the displacement of the motor. This means that in one revolution of the pump, there's enough fluid put out to drive the motor one revolution. With the electric motor driving the pump at 1200 RPM, the hydraulic motor would also run at 1200 RPM, neglecting a little internal leakage since nothing's perfect. Now, let's cut the pump size in half, say from 10 to 5 gallons per minute. You got it the 10 GPM motor would run at 600 RPM. Rather than change the pump to change the motor speed, let's install a flow control valve. It has an adjustable opening we can set to pass any portion of the pump delivery. At five gallons per minute, the motor would turn at 600 RPM. Increasing or decreasing its speed is just a matter of increasing or decreasing the size of the flow control orifice. Now, I'd better point out that pump flow, which does not go through the flow control, returns to tank through the relief valve at its setting, and that wastes energy. Looking at the brighter side, though, that same fluid could be used to perform other operations in our circuit at the same time. So, another advantage in using hydraulics is the ability to use a single power source and perform several different functions simultaneously. Now, let's take a minute to recap what we've done. We started with an electric motor, which ran at a constant speed in one direction and could not be stalled. We now have a hydraulic motor, which can be run at infinitely variable speeds in either direction and stalled under load without damage. We did it with only three valves, a directional control, a flow control, and a pressure control, also known as a relief valve. 
You've probably already realized that these same components would enable a cylinder to function in essentially the same way as the motor. In fact, these components are the main ingredients of even the most complicated systems. By now, you're probably thinking that this hydraulic stuff is pretty simple, and you're right. Before you start out on your own, however, there are a few more things you should know. Oil is still the fluid most commonly used, but as slick as it is, it still takes some effort to push it through a line. I know that's the pump's job, but we want to make it as easy as possible. Did you know when you double the diameter of a pipe or tube, you increase the area four times? Perhaps it's more important to know that a tube with only half the diameter of the original one would have only one-fourth the area. That means the same amount of fluid would have to move four times as fast through it, and the friction would increase proportionately. Now, what does this mean in practical application? If you must replace a line, use the same size or a little larger, and avoid as many elbows and bends as possible. Another thing, a surprising number of people, and probably some of you, think a pump sucks the oil out of the reservoir. It doesn't. A pump merely lowers the pressure at its inlet, and fluid is pushed in by atmospheric pressure acting on the surface. Inlet lines are especially important because with only 14.7 PSIA doing the pushing, any restriction or even too thick an oil may cause the pump to starve. The technical word for this starving is cavitation, and it causes an erosion type damage within the pump. An air leak at the inlet causes similar problems. Here, let me demonstrate cavitation by restricting the pump inlet. This is the normal sound level. This is cavitation. Enough of that. Too often people think that a pump pumps pressure. And that's not only wrong, it's downright misleading. I say that because the pump gets blamed whenever you can't build up enough pressure. And that isn't even the pump's job. All the pump is supposed to do is make the oil flow. Pressure is caused by resistance to flow. If you don't have enough pressure to do the job, it's usually because the oil has found an easier way to get back to the reservoir. Next time someone has this problem, find out where the oil is going and you'll be a hero. Here's another clue. If a cylinder stops or even slows down, either you're not putting as much oil into it as you were or it's leaking past the piston. To check, block the cylinder so it can't move and remove the opposite line. Be sure it's the opposite line, not the side under pressure, or you'll be sorry. Seriously though, be very careful in removing any hydraulic line. Be sure it doesn't go to a cylinder or motor that's supporting a load. If it does, either lower the load or support it so it can't fall. An accumulator, too, stores oil under pressure even with the machine shut down. If you're unsure about it, find someone who knows before touching a thing. I suppose you already know that increasing the relief valve setting doesn't increase the speed of a cylinder or motor. It's the amount of oil available and the size of the actuator that determines speed. That's why little cylinders move faster than big ones in the same system. Increasing the pressure will let you clamp tighter or move a heavier load. But be sure you don't try to exceed what the system is designed to do. Back at the start of this discussion, we used an electric motor to drive a pump. And you may have wondered, how big a motor? To determine this, we have to know how much force or torque was needed to do the job. That would tell us the pressure required and the size of the actuator. Then, knowing how fast the actuator had to move, we could determine the amount of fluid in gallons per minute that would be needed. Well, we have a formula to determine the horsepower required to move a given flow rate at a known pressure. You may want to make a note of it. 
horsepower equals gallons per minute times pounds per square inch times point oh 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 five eight three. That point oh 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 five eight three is a constant. It's the horsepower required to move one gallon per minute at one pound per square inch. Actually, this formula tells us the horsepower output of the pump. If the pump were 100% efficient, it would also be the input horsepower required to drive it. Unfortunately, pumps aren't 100% efficient. In fact, few things are. We would probably be safe in assuming that a well-designed pump in good condition should be between 80% and 90% efficient. The electric motor size, or input horsepower, requires that we include pump efficiency in our formula as follows. Horsepower equals gallons per minute times pounds per square inch times point oh 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 five eight three divided by pump efficiency. Well, that wraps up chapter one in our eight part series basic hydraulic principles. If we haven't overloaded your sensory capacitors with too much information too fast, and if you combine what you've learned today with plenty of good common sense, you have the basic ingredients to become a first-rate hydraulics person. Thanks for your attention. I'm Paul Cook for Sperry Vickers. This presentation on hydraulic pumps is the second in a series of eight, which provides a comprehensive introduction to hydraulics, the science of fluid under controlled pressure. I'm Paul Cook for Sperry Vickers. Pumps fall into two basic categories, positive displacement and non-positive. Non-positive pumps are used primarily for circulating or transferring fluids. Examples would be the water pump on an automobile engine, or one used in a dishwasher or washing machine. Let's look at a schematic. Most non-positive pumps operate by centrifugal force. Fluids entering the center of the pump housing are thrown to the outside by means of a rapidly driven impeller. There is no positive seal between the inlet and the outlet ports, so the pressure that's obtained is a function of the drive speed. The output flow decreases as the resistance increases. These features make it impractical to use non-positive displacement pumps in most present-day hydraulic systems. Positive displacement pumps, on the other hand, deliver a definite quantity of fluid for every stroke, revolution or cycle. This illustration shows that on the intake stroke, fluid enters the pump through a check valve. On the forward stroke, the check valve closes, sealing off the inlet. Therefore, the fluid displaced as the piston is moved forward must flow through the pump outlet. The pressure is determined by the workload. This principle applies to all positive displacement pumps, whether they be vein, piston, or gear type. Perhaps the simplest and easiest to understand is a gear pump. One gear driven by the drive shaft meshes and rotates another, called the driven gear. Both are contained within a close-fitting housing. A partial vacuum is created at the inlet as the gear teeth unmesh, and fluid flows in to fill the void. Then the fluid is carried around the gears to the pump outlet. As the teeth go back into mesh, oil is forced out through the outlet port. As this operates, we now have high pressure at the outlet and less than atmospheric pressure at the inlet. This condition is referred to as unbalanced hydraulic loading. Gear pumps today are highly efficient units, capable of operating at pressures of up to 3,000 psi and speeds in excess of 2,000 rpm. This performance is at least partially the result of the addition of bronze-faced flexible wear plates. These plates are pressure loaded against the side faces of the gears, reducing clearance to a minimum. Passages in the wear plates 
also permit oil, under pressure, to extend farther around each gear to reduce the unbalanced hydraulic loading inherent in this type of pump. Sperry Vickers gear pumps range in size from 7 to 50 gallons per minute at 1,200 RPM, although considerably higher drive speeds are permissible. They're available as both single and double units. Other manufacturers have gear pumps that are rated as high as 100 gallons per minute. Vane pumps seem to have been favored in the machine tool industry, perhaps because of their high efficiency, low noise level, and long life. In an unbalanced vane pump, a slotted rotor is splined to the drive shaft and revolves inside a cam ring. Vanes are fitted into the rotor slots and follow the inner surface of the ring as the rotor turns. A minimum starting speed of 600 RPM will throw the vanes out. Then, centrifugal force and pump outlet pressure under the vanes hold them against the ring. Pumping chambers are formed between the vanes and are enclosed by the rotor, the ring, and two side plates. With the ring offset from the center line of the rotor, the chambers increase in size and take in fluid as they pass the pump inlet port. Then, as they cross over center, the chambers become progressively smaller and fluid is expelled at the pump outlet. This pump has a somewhat limited pressure capability because of its unbalanced hydraulic loading. Its displacement, however, can be varied or even be reduced to zero by moving the ring towards the center line of the rotor. Now, a balanced vane pump operates in the same manner as an unbalanced unit, the difference being that the inner contour of the ring is an ellipse rather than a circle. This configuration forms two sets of pumping chambers. They're on opposite sides of the rotor, but are interconnected through passages within the housing. Forces caused by pressure buildup on one side are canceled out by equal but opposite forces on the other. The displacement of a balanced design vane pump cannot be adjusted. However, interchangeable rings with different cam contours or widths are available, making it possible to quickly modify a pump to increase or decrease its delivery. Another modification we sometimes require is to reverse the drive shaft direction. We would, however, have to ensure that the flow direction within the pump is not reversed. The key to this situation is in the repositioning of the ring so that the major diameter of the inner cam is rotated 90 degrees from its original position. By doing this, the pumping chambers will continue to increase in size as they pass the inlet porting and decrease at the outlet. Flow through the pump will then remain the same even though drive shaft rotation has been reversed. Now, let's focus on three different types of balanced vane pumps Sperry Vickers currently manufactures. All are similar in operation, but differ in construction and pressure capabilities. We'll first discuss the pump patterned after the original model, patented by the company's founder, Mr. Harry Vickers, in 1925. Called the V104 series round pump, it has a replaceable pumping cartridge, which consists of a ring, rotor, and vanes sandwiched between two bronze bushings, each containing two inlet and two outlet ports. Hubs on the rotor fit into supporting hubs in the bushings, which serve as bearings. The drive shaft only requires a small pilot bearing in the pump cover and a somewhat larger one at the front to accommodate any minimal side loading. A two diameter pin keys the cartridge assembly together and fits into one of two holes in the pump body, which are located 90 degrees apart. The hole that we select determines whether the pump is assembled for right or left hand rotation. The pump cover serves as a clamp to hold the cartridge assembly together. Care must be exercised when tightening the cover bolts as over-tightening may cause the pump to seize. Under-tightening will result in loss of efficiency. The V104 is an extremely quiet and efficient pump, but its pressure and drive speed limitations of 1,000 PSI and 1,200 RPM limit its use in many of today's applications. So, where higher pressure and drive speeds are required, 
as in most mobile vehicle applications, the Sperry Vickers model V20, or square pump, is more apt to be found. With permissible speeds up to 3,400 RPM and pressure capabilities of 2,500 PSI, it's well suited to many vehicle applications. In this pump, the rotor and vanes are held against the machine surface of the body by a spring-loaded pressure plate. The outlet port is in the pump cover, enabling outlet pressure to assist the spring in holding the pressure plate firmly in position. The square cover permits the outlet port to be assembled in any of four positions with relation to the inlet, which is in the body. This, of course, simplifies piping during pump installation. By removing the cover, we can see the two pressure passages through the pressure plate, as well as the small holes which direct oil at outlet pressure to the underside of the veins. With the pressure plate removed, we can see that the slots in the rotor are radial. And while it may be more difficult to see, the vein tips have a symmetrical radius. This means that neither are affected by drive shaft rotation. Pump rotation is established by the position of the cam ring, removing the ring from the locating pins and replacing it with the opposite side facing the pump body, automatically rotates the cam 90 degrees, and the pump may be driven in the opposite direction. Arrows on the ring indicate proper rotation. The varying sized holes in the ring are called overpass holes. They improve pump inlet conditions by permitting oil to flow into the cartridge from both the body and the pressure plate side. Reassembling the pump is equally simple. With pressure plate loading being a function of system pressure, it's only necessary to tighten the cover bolts to their specified torque. But don't forget the little spring and O-ring seals. Now we come to the third and final version the Intravane series. This one is a truly high performance unit with deliveries of 109 GPM and pressure to 2,500 PSI, 3,000 PSI in smaller units. It too is a cartridge type pump where the ring, rotor, and vanes are contained between a pressure and wear plate held together by two small screws. These cartridges, incidentally, are available as pre-tested replacement units to speed pump overhaul and reduce downtime in the field. They're usually assembled for right hand, but can be reversed by reversing the ring, rotor, and vanes. The cartridge is accessible after removing the back cover, which in this case contains the pump inlet port. It may be necessary to grasp the cartridge firmly and give it a slight twist as you pull it out of the body. An O-ring seal and backup ring around the hub of the pressure plate prevent leakage into the shaft seal area, but also resist removal of the cartridge. Now then, you'll note something different when we examine the cartridge. The two previous pumps had solid vanes, and outlet pressure acted under their entire bottom surface to hold them firmly against the ring. In these pumps, with their large vanes and high pressures, the forces involved could reduce both ring and vein life due to high vein tip loading. Remember, force equals pressure times area. As a remedy, holes were drilled through each rotor segment, extending from its outer surface to the bottom of the vein slot ahead of it. By chamfering the tip of each vein, the pressure at the chamber behind it acted on both its top and bottom surface, keeping it in hydraulic balance. One further step was necessary to be sure that the veins would follow the contour of the ring at high drive speeds. Now, this was accomplished by incorporating an intravein, or a small insert, in each vein, and permitting outlet pressure to act in the small area between them. This pressure, plus centrifugal force, holds the veins against the ring to assure proper tracking at any permissible speed. The intravein is used successfully in high pressure machinery and in press circuits as well as mobile vehicles. To make it more compatible with the temperature extremes in which mobile units must operate, 
bronze-faced steel flex plates have been added to the cartridge assembly. They're much like and serve the same purpose as those mentioned previously in our discussion on gear pumps. Although interchangeable with the original intravein cartridge, they're not required and unlikely to be used for machine tool application at the present time. Piston pumps, because of their high efficiency, high pressure, and high price, were used in aircraft and military applications, as well as in large hydraulic presses, where their cost could be justified. Today, however, simplified designs have lowered their costs, while still retaining the beneficial features of piston-type units. As a result, they're being used in increasing numbers in both mobile and industrial applications. All piston pumps operate on the principle that a piston reciprocating in a bore will take in fluid as it's retracted and expel it on the forward stroke. Two basic designs are available, one known as a radial and the other an axial piston pump. A radial pump has pistons which reciprocate radially in a cylinder block, which rotates on a stationary pendle and inside a circular reaction ring. Some force, usually charging pressure and or springs, holds the pistons out against the inner contour of the ring. With a ring offset from the center line of the cylinder block, the pistons reciprocate in their bores, taking in and expelling fluid through porting in the pendle. Moving the reaction ring will change the length of piston travel, thereby varying the pump displacement and output flow. In axial pumps, the pistons are parallel to each other and to the cylinder block axis. They may be either bent axis or inline units. The cylinder block in a bent axis pump rotates at an angle to the drive shaft. The pistons are fastened to the drive shaft flange by ball joints and are forced in and out of their bores as the distance between the cylinder block and drive shaft flange changes. Pumps of this type may be fixed or variable displacement. The latter, with proper controls, will even reverse the direction of flow if the yoke is moved across center. The cylinder block of an inline pump fits over and is driven by splines on the drive shaft. The pistons fit into bores in the cylinder block and attached to shoes. The shoes, in turn, are held against an angled swash plate by a spring-loaded retractor ring. As the shaft and cylinder block are rotated, the pistons reciprocate in their bores as they follow the angle of the swash plate. In fixed displacement units, the swash plate angle is determined by a machined surface in the pump body and cannot be changed. Variable models have a movable yoke which holds the swash plate and permits it to be pivoted to any desired angle up to the maximum displacement of the pump. Here too, various controls are available from manually controlled levers to pressure compensators. A compensator is a device which permits full pump delivery up to a preset maximum pressure. When this setting has been reached, a small spool valve shifts and directs fluid into a piston, which destrokes the pump, reducing its output to only what is required to maintain pressure. When outlet pressure drops due to changes in the workload, a spring returns the yoke to its full stroke position. By reducing pump flow, instead of dumping it over a relief valve, heat losses are held to a minimum with a commensurate saving in energy. Okay, that wraps up our discussion of hydraulic pumps. As I'm sure you've come to realize, the pump is the heart of the hydraulic system. Just as your heart serves as a pump for your circulatory system, it isn't a bad analogy at all. An ineffective pumping mechanism means almost as much trouble for a machine tool as it does the human body. I'm Paul Cook for Sperry Vickers.